today's Energy Central Power Session, sponsored by ESRI, the global leader in geographic informational systems software. Our theme for today is maturing of GIS, baby steps to quantum leaps. Now to kick things off, I'm happy to turn the floor over to ESRI's own Bill Meehan, Director of Electric Utilities Industry Solutions. Bill, welcome to the event. You have hey, the floor. Thank Hey, thanks, PJ. We have a kind of an interest. This is going to be a real interesting event here, and I'm sure everybody was curious about the title, Baby Steps to Quantum Leap. Well, uh, for many people uh, that have been involved in GIS, you know that uh, uh, GIS it can be kind of a, I don't know, a back office. It's, people think of GIS kind of back office. I almost like to start off a presentation by saying, what's the first word that comes to mind when you hear the term GIS, and and in an if it's if it's a, you know open audience, people will yell out uh, maps. Everybody says, "Oh, maps!" And, and you know, for those of us who have been involved in GIS for many many years, it's always been about maps. And I always think about um, things like when when and when I was working for the power company, uh, I, I was the pioneer for, for the GIS. And uh, people, when we converted from the old paper maps to GIS. Everybody said, "Oh, I, you know, I kind of, I kind of like the the old maps. I like the way the old maps looked." And so we spent a lot of time figuring out how to migrate paper maps to to digital form and making sure that you know those GIS maps looked exactly like the old paper maps. In fact, sometimes people didn't like the way they looked. They're, they're kind of too clean. Can maybe, and we used to tease each other and the, the GIS team. Well, maybe we should put a coffee stain symbol in the GIS to make sure everybody remembers that these GIS is, is a conversion. So there's an awful lot of, of thought about uh, GIS should be a faster way of making and, and actually plotting out the old paper maps. I know for those of us who have been in, involved in that for years. So so it was kind of like, and not only did we, we plot them out, but then once we plotted them out, we forgot that they were digital and we used them like the old paper map. We'd stick them on the walls during the outages and we'd lay them on the floor and tape them together and all that kind of stuff. So I think of that, that's kind of the baby steps. We we went from paper to GIS, but we were kind of doing a, a kind of a baby step. So today I believe, and this is where kind of I hope we're going to get some conversation and maybe some debate here, that we've gone from the baby steps of converting things, you know, making sure we put the KVA in the right spot on the maps so will be plotted out to a quantum leap that GIS is really enterprise, strategic, standing alongside ERP and SCADA and AMI, that it's now become kind of an equal player in the utility. And that's, to me, that's that's a quantum leap. So we're going to introduce everybody in, in this great panel, and we've got Tom and Peter and Angela and Pat Hall. Uh, and, and again, so my name is Bill Meehan. I'm the director of Electric Utility Solutions, kind of a, a emeritus, uh, uh, you know, kind of a senior person. Uh, and um, I've been involved in, in the GIS business for, oh, for years and years and years. And uh, I've been with ESRI for 20 years. And before that, I was with uh, the, a power company where I was uh, head of operations and engineering and a variety of, of, of uh, tasks. So I'm going to ask the, our panelists to, to have them introduce themselves, say who they are and where they work and a little bit about themselves. But then, um, am, am I right? Have we gone from baby steps to quantum leap in terms of GIS being an enterprise system. And I and let's start off with uh, Angela. Angela, talk about yourself and who you are and am I full of crap or what? Maybe not about this, Bill, but it could be something else. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so first of all, I'm Angela Marr and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. So um, I am a GIS supervisor. Um, overseeing our GPS barcoding program. I've been in the utility industry for just about 17 years. First 10 were on the electric side um, at another company, and the last just about seven have been on the gas side. Um, and I see our company, um, we use GIS. We're very advanced using our GIS. And um, I heard a good analogy yesterday, actually, which um, I think if you can picture this, like a water scenario. So um, to me, baby steps are like a lake where you have your water that just stays still stagnant water, okay? 
and then you move over to like brackish water. So you still got a little bit of the stagnant water, but moving towards like an ocean flow and incorporating more and more. Um, and now we're at a point where we're in the ocean. Um, we're using GIS as our system of record, um, and we use it even in the field. So we can make live updates in the field, um, and we make them internally here too. So we're pretty robust with ours. So if you were to give me an opportunity to say, you know, what are the three words I think of when you mention GIS, I would say system of record. And that, you know, pretty much sums it up. We use it quite a bit for everything. Well, that's great. Thanks. Hey, I forgot to ask, why don't we each person tell where they are in the, in, in the world here? Where, where are you? You're in, in Florida, right, Angela? Right. I happen to be in Tampa, Florida. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, though. That's the, the ah, me too. <laughs> I'm from Massachusetts originally as well. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've been here seven years, and um, yeah, I, I love it. I don't miss the winters. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, Peter, what about you? Um, well, I'm over here actually in England, uh, a rural hotel somewhere on the outer edges of the internet. So uh, if you are not able to hear me, shout at me. Uh, coming through okay at the moment perfect great and so so yeah so I've, I've worked in the industry for 36 years now I was counting um, and previously been CTO at, at GE Small World Intergraph and IQ Geo so I spent a lot of my career being leader of the resistance to Esri you might say uh, but then these days I'm working at SSP Innovations an Esri partner so uh, happy to be part of the Esri ecosystem these days uh, I'm working on some uh, exciting new technology developments um, uh, around data capture, and uh, and I think you know on the topic of is GIS maturing? Uh, I, I actually would say it's not maturing yet, in the sense that I think we're going to see more changes in the next five years than we've seen in the last forty. So, which I wouldn't count as as maturing. So it, I think it's accelerating in many ways, uh, and you know really excited about what we see coming up um, and, and you know I think one of the areas that uh, really is the thing that I'm most excited about is that I think there are big challenges in data quality and I know you've mentioned that as well Bill and everybody I talk to uh, sees that I think uh, but I think that's one of the areas that is really going to see these very dramatic changes in the next few years and um, I'm sure we'll come back and talk more about that as we, we go through the panel here. Um, so that's about, a bit about me and the areas I'm interested in right now. All right. Uh, thanks, Peter. Hey, Pat. Pat's a colleague of mine at Esri, and uh, I think we always said collectively between myself and Pat, we have, I don't know how many, I keep changing. Is it like 50 years or 100 years of, of uh, utility experience or something like that? But turn it over to Pat Hull. It's a big number. Thanks, Bill. Well, I joined the Esri Utilities team about five years ago after a career in utility engineering operations, uh, technology, and leadership. And Bill and I have uh, similar roles. We kind of timeshare the, uh, the the spot at, at Esri. But Bill, I would say that the utility industry itself is moving from incremental steps, which we have seen uh, over the years, a better cutout, a better switch, uh, voltage conversions. You know, we've been doing things like that for, for decades. And now we're looking at what we have called a, a moonshot of uh, transition, energy transition. And the real question is, how will we get there? You know, there are so many factors to be considered. People often complain uh, or cite the fact that they've got so much data and they don't know how to make sense of it. And what I like to tell people is that everything that a utility is concerned with has a location. And GIS is the technology that's capable of bringing all those different kinds of data together around this sense of location to understand what that means and then help that to take action. So I would suggest that GIS is the only system that can really integrate all the factors that we have to concern ourselves with these days, not only managing the network, but the demographics of, of customers, environmental considerations, uh, weather and, and so many other things. Make sense of them, find the opportunities, and optimize our work to meet those objectives. And um, I very much respect Peter's view on this. I think GIS has made steps along the way, but we have some big leaps uh, coming, and I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah thanks, Pat. Speaking of big leaps, Tom, what do you think? 
And who are you? And where are you? You, for, Pat, you forgot to say where you yeah. where you're located. Yeah, I'm out of the greater Denver area. Hi, everyone. I'm a UDC's executive solution architect. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit longer bio just because it follows the progression of GIS pretty well, right? So I started out actually with Hughes Aircraft Company, and I built a GIS with real-time feeds for Northern NATO. Uh, peace broke out, the Berlin Wall came down, and it became a great gaming tool for all the bunkers, but that was kind of my first taste. Uh, it took 10 years to build it. If I started with today's GIS, it probably would have been you know two to three years, uh, but we didn't have anything like it back then. Uh, I've been helping gas and electric utilities for over 30 years. Actually, Bill and Pat were two of my first clients. Uh, we always, I guess, have been a big proponents of pushing uh, more than just you know data collection, data maintenance from a GIS perspective. So I think to answer Bill's question, I, I do think it's ready to jump into the enterprise, and we've been pushing that. Uh, for a long time, right? In the 90s, we made a lot of traction deploying what I call EDRP. So GIS, job design, work management, outage management, uh, mobile work management, and engineering analysis integrated with CIS and ERP and, and SCADA typically. Uh, those were some you know, really good years of deploying best of breed. And, uh, you know, that, that was one kind of one phase of the, of the GIS. Uh, my last 15 years, I've really moved and concentrated a lot on the operational side of utilities. So integrating with things like ADMS, AMI, uh, distributed energy resources and demand side management deployments have, have really been a, a key there. And um, definitely there's some uh, issues around data governance, which uh, Energy Central let me blog on uh, a few few years ago but yeah any ADMS project is uh, going to start a, a new uh, governance issue as well typically for utilities um, last but not least I guess I was able to come up with a, a fairly uh, vendor agnostic uh, pipeline safety management reference system architecture uh, being asked to come in and help with after San Bruno uh, so we use their technologies originally, but since I've evolved it, uh, there's seven kind of generic technologies in our solution, and GIS forms the foundation for three of uh, the technologies that we see are key to solving that type of problem. Uh, when I joined UDC about eight years ago, actually my boss asked the same question that Bill asked, right? What does UDC belong investing in to stay current? and be ahead of what utilities are, are needing. And so we actually started a few R&D initiatives eight years ago, right, that really came out with what I call enterprise class GIS application frameworks. Uh, that means, you know, web using either uh, the GIS itself or just using the GIS technology uh, and expanded into other areas of the business. So one of those was we worked closely hand in hand with Northeast uh, Gas Association and actually have built a gas OMS, right? Uh, the gas industry was kind of left a little bit behind when you look at their OT systems. And we think the GIS is a great foundation for that. And we can get a little more into that later in the discussion that you know, warrants it. I just wanted to highlight that this was done before the Merrimack Valley incident and before the Londell or Lionel Rondel Act came out, but the gas oil mass being based on GIS really meets all of the Rondell Act from a compliance point of view. So it's definitely worth looking at GIS to solve that problem. Uh, the other big, I guess, R&D project that we had started eight years ago, and I'm hoping Bill is right that uh, the industry is starting <laughs> to move, right? Uh, otherwise. Uh, I wasted my boss's money, but around using enterprise GIS as a you know enterprise asset management compliance management system from planning, uh, creating, scheduling, dispatching, monitoring, performing work in the field, 
and reporting to your commissions. Hmm. So with that, let me hand it back to Bill. All right. Hey, that's that's great. Thanks. Thanks, folks. I just want to remind everybody uh, listening in the audience that um, please, please ask us questions and challenge, challenge us, you know, say, hey, Tom, I, I don't know. I don't believe that or or Angela or Pat or Peter, uh, because we, we want your participation and you can just use the chat. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, ask a, a series of uh, questions uh, to the panelists and they will answer. And and then again, if you if you hear something that you either don't agree with or that you want to say make a comment on, uh, please uh, put it in the chat and we will um, we will answer it as best we can. But before we get to the first theme, I want to pick up something that that Pat had said that maybe utilities and this would be gas and electric utilities or water utilities actually for that matter that we're seeing a, a, a something kind of new happening in the in the business, and that is in the modeling of equity. And by that I mean social equity, where people, you know, demographics and uh, people of color, and mapping out el the elderly or the peoples with disability, and and not just mapping it out. And that's fine to map it out in, in a GIS, but it's also to sort of collaborate or kind of consolidate and see what's going on. So where, when we have outages, are we impacting a certain segment of the population in a different way yeah. or when we're investing? I mean, that that's a whole new thing that I see emerging. And maybe when we, when we, a lot of times when we think about GIS, we still think about engineering and I'm an engineer, Pat's an engineer of, of how the, the engineering aspect of it but now it, it really is, especially as we see some of these these new things like in electric vehicles roll out, we're seeing more and more concern about social equity and 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 uh, public utility commissions are looking at to make sure that the utilities are serving all of the population in, in an equitable sort of way. And we can comment about that. And Pat, I know you have some thoughts about that. Uh, and we've discussed that over the years. And that's really where GIS really shines, doesn't it? And those are things that we, we haven't really seen before. So really our first, kind of our first theme is, if Bill is right or if Peter is right, uh, and here's the question, and even, even even because we never get, it's not a, it's not an event or an end result or a race that we win, it's a, it's a journey of, of development. I think that's where Peter was going. So the question really is for the audience, what obstacles do you see that limit the use of GIS from being a truly enterprise and maybe some thoughts about how we might fix it? And so I'm going to just give some of my thoughts, having worked in the utility industry and in uh, in GIS for many years and people and, and I think Tom and, and Peter have alluded to it, data quality. Um, and, and I think part of the problem is that we never we didn't start with a blank sheet we started with these old paper i talked about it earlier these old paper maps that um well they were they were used for really kind of generalized mapping but they weren't they weren't really that that great frankly i mean and i'm an electrical person and so you know phasing was never um, very good, and you know when when utilities uh, during a power failure, they uh, you know a transformer falls in the ground off a pole, and they put it back. Maybe they put it back in another spot, and they don't tell anybody, or they change the phase, or it was just it just gets messy. And um, and while it looks much better than the old paper maps, it's mu much of what we're really the, having a legacy of is we're still suffering to some extent from the legacy of our paper map system, not just the, the how we use the maps, but just the data itself. And I think that's something that we really have to address as we, if we're really going to have something called a digital twin, you know, we've heard that that's a buzzword, a digital twin of the, of the uh, network, the data has got to be precise. It's got to be really precision. And, and I don't, I frankly don't think we're there. And there are the, the other thing that I, that I like is, is that because we're really dealing with, a different system coming down the road with EVs and 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 uh, distributed resources and power and solar panels. We can't just be kind of sloppy about how we model things. We have to model things in a better way. So better de network modeling is is going to be interesting. Also, I think we've got to clean up our processes. I mean, you know, utilities have been around for hundred over 120, 130 years. But yet we still kind of like to use to do things the same old way, and we need to clean up our processes. 
And, and uh, I think one of the beauties of GIS is the ability to do spatial analysis analytics. So I'm going to turn it over to, I think we're still going to, I'm going to start with you again, Angela, on this one. And, and, mm -hmm. and so what are the obstacles you see? And you, you see, especially in the gas industry with, you know, uh, I can't say this, tracking and traceability. I said it right, I think, didn't I? Just that you did, tracking you did, and you traceability, did. yeah. And, and, with, <laughs> and, you know, so, so give us a sense of what obstacles do you see? What are the things that you see going on that, that maybe prevent us from getting nirvana to where we really want to be? Right. So, so I think with what you said about the data, you know, maybe it's not quite up to par um, and we need to get there for that. Um, I agree with that, and part of our tracking and traceability program um, focuses on GPS and barcoding. Um, so we have requirements where we want to know where our services are in the ground within a subfoot, you know, accuracy, really. Um, and many times we're capturing it within a couple inches. Um, we want to know what are those services made up of, what are the parts, um, and we want to know who are the people, who, who put it in, who fused, who, who did what. Um, so through this program, um, being able to capture that, so like an electronic as-built, if you will, um, that feeds into our GIS system. So already you're getting better data than you would have at, at one previous time. Uh, with our barcode scanners, we are actually barcoding just like you would at a grocery store. Uh, a barcode is on a pipe or is on a valve, a fitting, um, and we're scanning that and it's telling our system, hey, this was made by this manufacturer on this date as part of that lot number. And, you know, a quick example is how that is, has been beneficial to us is we just had an exercise where we found a valve that we had installed in the Miami area was um, defective and we needed to know, hey, where is that located? And if we hadn't used GPS barcoding, we would have been flipping through paper as bills and maps, like you mentioned, to locate that. But instead, because we have this information brought in um, electronically now, we were able to just develop a report, pull up and find where they were and can take us right there. So, you know, the, the obstacle is getting and maintaining accurate information and being able to turn around and use that information in situations where, um, you know, it can improve safety, um, it, it builds confidence with the, uh, you know, with our customers and within the industry overall. So um, yeah. that's what I think about, you know, the data quality, and we're working towards it. So sure, you know, you must have, you must have been uh, mind reading the audience because one of the questions was coming in just before you answered your question. It said, "What methods have you been used to improve data quality?" Boom. Okay. That, that certainly, and and that's that's really kind of innovative and. And it's been around for a long time, but we just haven't really used it. So that's certainly one way. There, there are other things, and I, and I think some of us may have additional ways to help improve the data quality. It seems to me data quality is two, two sides of that coin. One is the legacy stuff that's in the ground, you know, already there. And the other one is how do we make sure that when we get the new data for the new stuff that we put it in correctly? Pat, you want to pick it up from here? Sure. Yeah, Tom knows that I'm a bit of a stickler on data quality. Uh, I, I would say that uh, the most important thing, because the second part of your question was how do we fix that? And I think the most important things utilities could do today is first assess their data quality and think about what they mean by data quality, because that could refer to accuracy of the data that's in there, as you've suggested about conversion from paper things. It could be completeness, uh, how mm -hmm. thorough the, that, that data is, or even the timeliness of that data. You know, right. Most utilities have fairly extensive as building processes um, that I think I think Peter prepared to talk about some ways that that could be sped up something I'm very interested in I worked in engineering and maps and records for a long time uh, in fact when I started our GIS data conversion way back when with Tom um, the very first thing we had to do was catch up the six month backlog of, uh, of um, updates that, that had to be applied to the system and and everybody has similar stories. I would say another way that we can fix that is to increase the awareness within the, the company outside of the maps and, and records function. You know, sometimes when we think about making a giant leap, we think that we just have to take the same old crank and turn it a lot faster than we used to. And I don't think that's gonna get us where we need to go to. Um, 
you know, Esri puts a lot of money into research and development. GIS has changed an awful lot in the last decade. And many workflows like mobile uses and analytics have just gotten much, much easier. And I would recommend that people learn what the leaders are doing, uh, like People's Gas, find out what others are doing in terms of network management and operations and customer care, and go out and steal the very best ideas that you can find. In fact, I'll make an offer if, if well, anyone. Leverage. Don't steal. Leverage. Leverage. I like leverage better than steal. Just, can we? Well, Bill and I, Bill and I talk we, about words a lot. Steal? Steal? Can we delete the steal thing? No, no, I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> steal is a good word because it gets people's attention, right? They got your attention, Angela. Um, but go leverage the best ideas that you can find. We have a lot of examples. We like to write up uh, examples of customer successes. And I'll make an offer if anybody wants to ping me, I would be happy to send you. Uh, links to customer success stories in, in different areas. I'm pretty easy to find. I assume most people have already Googled me or looked me up on LinkedIn. Okay. What about you, Tom? Do you have any thoughts about what some obstacles are in? From truly yeah, being um, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of road mapping recently, and the biggest one I'm finding, a little bit uh, surprising, is we have to re-educate, right, the utility execs. So. I think we had them going pretty well on what GIS can bring to the table at the enterprise level and with all the mergers and acquisitions and turnovers that really have a new team that we have to educate, right? So they, they think, like Bill said, maps and letting them know that it's so much more from asset management, compliance to operation, operational awareness type of stuff. It just takes time to educate them. Uh, and then timing right now, I think, is the other obstacle. They're just starting their planning cycles, right? Major upgrades. So most of the industry had invested, you know, years ago, and it takes a while to get the budgetary cycles approved. Uh, I will say that in at least all the business cases that I do, I have six or more business releases. The first two typically are the foundational migrate upgrade. And then the next four or five, six, whatever, are all based on enterprise uses. And there's no way, I mean, to get uh, these roadmaps approved without all that other value, right? So I think thinking enterprise is the only way to get upgrades approved when they've been using GIS for, you know, for years. Um, I think the other barrier uh, we're seeing, or another one, uh, the modern integration paradigms are being supported by you know, GIS and the other enterprise systems, but that doesn't mean our utility counterparts have embraced them all, right? So I'm getting them to move into some of the newer architectures so we can be event-driven type of stuff will help a lot. Uh, as I said, I date way back working with Bill, so you know I'm pretty old. Uh, oh, come on, come on. Yeah. So, the, so, so the GIS has come a long ways from its client server. So I'm interested in this here from uh, Peter as well, what we think that maybe the newer stuff is going to be either on top of the new web and cloud architectures and, you know, moving with containers. Uh, getting the utilities to adopt the cloud, though, Bill, I think is another hurdle that we have to do. Right, and right. Last but not least, and I don't want to be on a soapbox, but I probably will be a little bit, right, is that I, I think we have to have uh, enterprise applications frameworks readily available because all my business releases are, say, in that 10, 18 time frame. But that's assuming the utilities are starting with this type of application or framework and it just gets instantiated, right, that the utility with its set of enterprise OT departmental level integrations. Most utilities aren't gonna spend the time or the energy to build uh, the type of framework that's possible with enterprise GIS. So getting the commercial uh, folks involved and having them build it, I think is is key. Uh, while I like to think that you know UDC started eight years ago and is probably one of the leaders in this, we are seeing a bunch of offerings recently, right? And I think that's because uh, utilities are moving that way and the enterprise roadmap, so at least that I'm getting approved and budgeted, uh, have adoption, right, for all lines of business. So I think, you know, those are the big hurdles is, of course, one is getting the money approved so they can spend it on this type of mission. 
Hmm. Hey, thanks, Tom. Tom, well, Tom can, I, can I ask you a follow up here on Pat's uh, question or not? Okay, Pat, Pat, yeah, you yeah. ask, you're going to ask some of Yeah, question, I was just going right? to ask you a follow-up here. One of the questions has come in for, from the audience, uh, and, and I'll read it to you. It says, one of our GIS challenges is differences of opinion on whether or not GIS can really be a full EAM system. Could you talk a little, a little bit about GIS capabilities for things like asset condition assessment, outstanding issue tracking, work planning, work management? I think this is right down your alley where you were headed. Yeah, is no, this is growing this into is, those spaces, or is it more of a visualization visualization tool for that data no, no. than a system to manage the data? There yeah, you go. And, and, and I really think, based on the sophistication of the client, it can do the whole thing. But what I like to say is start thinking of your existing EAM, be the cash register, right? The GIS is not the place to manage money, but everything else. So if you do your planning visually, uh, and generate new things like program areas, CP areas, all the stuff you need to manage work, uh, create all that in, in the GIS uh, that can generate the work. So whether you schedule it manually from the GIS or use some high-end system scheduling as integration to get it scheduled or trickle scheduled, right? So I'm not saying that GIS is caught up by any means with some of the high-end schedulers I've put in, but it can be it can generate the demand for those schedulers, right? And then definitely the field component is so much cleaner with a GIS and I'll say a runtime-based app that has GIS work management, content document management, all integrated for the end user, right? So that change management issue comes way down if you have it at their fingertips all the data they need to do their job. And now you're monitoring it daily, right? So you're not asking anyone to do anything separately. It's just part of the workflow. Every day as the field does stuff, it's automatically updating your dashboard. So you could look at uh, where you're at. And by having a, what I call it, a common system, uh, utilities have, let's say, 40 compliance programs and inspection and maintenance programs. This gives you a nice unified approach for management uh, to look at and see where they're at. And I think since stuff like Sam Bruno, right, you got VPs that are responsible, having that nice enterprise wide look is, is very nice. Uh, last, last but not least, the, the closing, like I said, of work has to happen typically with the EAM system. So I'm always going to be a big proponent of closing with EAM. But from a condition base inspection, based uh, type of programs, right? Bringing in stuff like AI and the machine learning into the GIS, right? We're definitely seeing uh, both clients and other uh, vendors using the GIS to generate very good condition-based maintenance type of programs. Now, I will say, uh, as you get further up that asset management food chain in terms of paradigm, and you have more expensive assets, uh, like substation transformers, breakers, those I think need to be synced still with EAM and using some of those higher end uh, asset management paradigms. Makes sense to stay there because they've been there for a long time. But when you think about a lot of what utilities do, it's survey, it's periodic, which lends itself to the GIS for laying out that work and managing all that work. Sorry to be long winded. All right, there you go, Peter. Come on, you get the last word on this one. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, so the topic, I think we've talked about a lot of good things there, but was what limits the GIS from being truly enterprise? Um, and I guess I had a couple of things to talk about. One one was data quality, uh, which several of you touched on, and, and actually maybe I'll come back to that because I, I think it may be on a couple of other things. But I think the other thing that I would highlight is uh, keeping things simple, which I, I think, um, is something I've had quite a bit of focus on in recent years, but really, um, you know, as GIS people, sometimes we're too, you know, into all the weeds and everything, and really getting enterprise benefits. Um, a lot of it is really putting simple applications out there, simple web viewers, and, and really focusing on making it usable. You know, I've always been a fan of when trying to do innovative things, looking both at what people are doing in the GIS industry, but also in, in other areas. And, you know, I think 
looking at consumer systems like Google Maps and Apple Maps can give us a lot of ideas on how to use our, our GIS web technologies and mobile technologies in ways that are just really simple for users. And, you know, that's a great way of moving it up, getting more visibility, getting it more strategic in the company. You know, if you have thousands of users out there, everybody who needs access to a map or network data, you know, has it on their device, on their phone. Um, that's a great way of um, making it more enterprise and, and more strategic. So, so I think uh, I would say really focus on simplicity and trying to make it accessible to, to non-GIS people in the enterprise. Uh, and data quality is huge, but maybe we'll come back to that on a, another iteration around here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I had, I had a couple of comments. Uh, well, first of all, before we get into to my comments, uh, Angela, there was there was a question uh, that we didn't get to, so we want to make sure we get to the audience. It's uh, and the question goes something like this: GI, uh, uh, no, this gets hard. And we're talking, they we're talking about GPS devices, um, costing. Uh, I think they mean twelve hundred dollars for sixty guys. I'm not quite sure. I think that's probably what it means. And training everyone to use them. We've just paid two point six million for our system. More of a comment. Um, so, what do you what do you say about that? I mean, is it, about the because the, I think that's a real that you know for especially for the gas industry that with, with what we're talking about is is that a is that a the cost aspect of of uh, uh, these units is that is that an obstacle as well? Oh, I, I I'd like to say I'd like to know where they get their equipment from. I'd love to pay twelve hundred. <laughs> uh, well, so, yeah, please whoever wrote that question, see, get the call Angela and tell her. Yeah. Well, I guess it maybe too depends on the type of accuracy you're looking for, right? So, um, you know, our GPS unit alone I can speak to um, is now over $6,000. So that's just one piece of equipment. We issue out kits to, um, so contractors do our install of new services typically, okay? So we issue out a kit. So a kit includes um, a GPS unit, a laser range finder, um, it includes a, a Panasonic Tough Pad, a barcode scanner, and a pole for the GPS unit to stay on it. Um, and that whole kit costs a little over thirteen thousand dollars. So that's that's our investment per crew, pretty much. Um, and the company, you know, when we did this program, it was well over four million dollars to implement this. We have about two hundred crews between 180, 200 crews out all across Florida using this. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge investment um, and it's uh, equipment, you know, can fail after time. So you have to reinvest in it, right? Keep, keep buying it. Um, so I'm hoping prices do come down, but you know, it's a, it's a safety issue for us. You know, we, we mm -hmm. see this as an investment in our safety in our system. You know, if you, if something goes wrong in a gas industry, we all know, you know what can happen it's, it can be terrifying um, and have long-range um, implications you know so it, and even so much so as changing uh, you know legislation which is actually what started this whole um, GPS program at our company was pending legislation for tracking and traceability so companies knew you know where their stuff was within a you know finite uh, area and what that was made up of and who did it, like I had mentioned before. So um, it's it's hard. We actually, and just a side note, we at Pico People's Gas, we actually own the equipment. Um, we give it to the contractors um, to use, but they are responsible for it. Um, and if anything goes missing, um, they have to reimburse us for it. So uh, it's a huge investment, but um, the outcome of what we get from it is invaluable, right? Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's all about a return on investment and, and not just in terms of dollars, but also in terms of outcomes that you talk about, for, particularly around safety. Tom alluded to, he, he used the term San Bruno, which for those that are not, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody remembers, that was what, four or five years ago. So San Bruno was a city in California, Northern California that experienced a tremendously devastating fire for, for a, a, virtually a whole neighborhood as a result of, uh, 
uh, of a gas, uh, a, a transmission line gas explosion, uh, it, which, which uh, you know, part of it is is not having good data. I mean, realistically, there was, you know, or, or not having the right data. And, and, and again, that's a lot of a legacy. So one of the things that when, when I think about the obstacles and we talked about data quality, and there are really two aspects, I, I alluded to this earlier. The first one is the old stuff is there. I mean, that's that was what was San Bruno. San Bruno came from data that was just never either migrated or was just incorrect in in those days uh, and and then and then as we like you were saying angela when you're putting the new stuff in getting the right tools to make sure that the data goes in correctly that's why you know systems like gnss or gps that actually locate where things really are you know it, it goes back to a, a we, we pat and i did a presentation a couple of years ago a webinar a couple of years ago and i and i talked about a story where I had a septic system and I and I needed to pump it out every every couple of years. And so what I would and, and the problem was you needed to find the, the, the cover for the septic system, dig it out, right? So I I very carefully I, at first I didn't know where it was, so I started punching. It was like a like I had gopher holes all over the place because I was trying <laughs> to find, I was trying to find where the, the hole was for the you know for the for the cover. And so I dug it out very carefully and and then I put, um, you know, when they pumped it out and I put the, the grass, the, the, gr the round grass thing back in. But two years later, the grass grew over and then I, I couldn't find w w where the hole was that I dug up. And it's really about, so, so that's about productivity, capturing the data at the source when it actually happens or making sure that the data goes in place. And I forgot to do that. And so I ended up putting gopher holes all over the place again, even in the year afterwards. So good, you're really having good documentation about where, where things are located is, is really critical. So it's first of so all- So Bill, I have yeah. a question for you. Did yeah, you call 811 first before you started digging? Of course I did. <laughs> That's a good That's reminder. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was this was a long time ago. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really. I hope there's no documentation of it. So, so that that's about. So it's really the legacy thing. The further, the other thing about well, how do we capture the legacy? And I think that and Peter, you're you're a big advocate of this. The simplicity I love. But many of your utilities, even though they have a very good GIS, they don't have a mobility. I was I was calling. I I talked to a customer just today about their transformation from. Uh, where they were not that long ago uh, to getting rid of their their paper maps for field inspections and so forth. With mobility, now we begin to self-correct the legacy data. I'm out in the field, I see a problem, I see I have a data problem in my GIS, I can fix it, and Tom, you mentioned this as well, I don't have to wait, I don't have to write it on a piece of paper to send it back to the GIS group and it sits in a pile. I can I can fix that data right now. So unless I really want to spend a huge amount of money of doing field data, um, you know, doing a re recapturing of all the data in the field, putting in a real good mobility, a simple mobility, Peter, you always talked about mobility first, getting in a simple mobile application where you're using devices that everybody knows how to use their iPhones or their uh, Android devices or their, their uh, Microsoft devices. Those things can really help to, to improve the data quality really quickly. And Pat also talked about, um, just currency, and I remember we used to have a backlog of of unposted work. As but you were talking about Angela, talking about as that was that was a year. We used to have a year or two year backlog. Well, what the heck is you, you, we talk about GIS as the single source of truth? Well, it's not. It's the distant cousin, or it's not a digital <laughs> twin. It's a distant cousin because if the data is sitting in a pile someplace and not in the GIS, then it really is 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 an issue, and that's a process issue. Let's get the processes right. Okay, uh, uh, now, I think we had a go ahead. Somebody, Peter, you're going to say something, I think. Yeah, I, I was just going to say maybe I could follow up on on that as built topic a, a little bit as well, uh, just because I, I do feel that's a, a fundamental area for improvement. That is an area I've been looking at quite a lot, and, and really mm -hmm. to me the challenge there is that. Um, in order to really solve that, you need to be able to give the guys doing the construction or the installation, enable them to capture the information about what they just installed. And part of the challenge has been, you know, those sort of folks are typically technology resistant. And even with the kind of simplest forms based applications and so on, mm. it's been it's been hard to get adoption from those construction guys. And that's where um, I feel there are really new technologies coming along now computer vision, machine learning, augmented reality that, you know, may, may sound like, uh, you know, quite forward looking things, but they're, they're really here today. Um, 
and so you know I, I feel that today that there's great possibilities with just having a simple app on your phone where you can basically point it at a piece of equipment it says you know that's a transformer cabinet scans all the attributes and it's much much simpler than the kind of uh, current generation of forms based and GPS systems so I, I think that that's a really exciting development and you know one of the things that I alluded to where you know that kind of technology is being developed on, on a lot of fronts um, you know by the Apples and the Googles and so on people outside the GIS industry but we can really integrate that into what we're doing with GIS and have these very very automated tools uh, for capturing information in the field and I think that's going to be a a real game changer and and something I'm very excited about. Yeah, that that's a great that's a great point. And actually, uh, one of the things that uh, we're seeing is a lot more use of uh, of imagery, uh, all kinds of, and not just imagery as a picture of imagery, but imagery using using an analytics of the imagery to find out things. But you talk about augmented reality, and a lot of times we say, well, what the heck is that? Everybody who watches an NFL game sees augmented reality because those those first down markers that are shown uh, and, and got yards ago, that's augmented reality. We're, we're, we're seeing the world, not just the way it, we can look at it through our eyes, but through through the data that's actually also embedded in the GIS and being able to see things that we couldn't see. And, and, and Angela, underground pipes. I mean, you can look at the, I want to see what the heck is under the ground right now. And, and not just guess at it, if I have good data, and I can see that using augmented reality. I agree. That, this is another. I've got another question. Bill, yeah, Bill, can I add to that? Yeah, yeah. So, from a currency point of view, right? I think, uh, like you said, it's it's business process, right? So, from an ADMS, I try to get the folks. Tom, to every, I'm, not everybody may know know what ADMS is. So, just say. I'm sorry. For. It's yeah. the uh, advanced distribution management systems. So, it's the newer generation that includes SCADA outage management and let's say 100 advanced applications for managing a grid so assuming that we want to get to that point where we have applications now running in closed loop issuing SCADA commands you really need to have that model right to have zero latency and so from a business process point of view uh, that typically means we need to get to the field and to the op center all proposed work that's scheduled as well as uh, completing all the as-builts in both as well so yep. bringing in the additional tools as, as peter's mentioned is going to help the guy in the field but from a process point of view really getting folks to think that hey they really need to be sending both views of the world so that uh, adms once things get de you know commissioned in the field uh, so you're gonna have subsets of a job getting commissioned at a time that next iteration of the optimization is going to use the newest model versus the previous incarnation of that model. So sure. I think it's pretty critical for ADMS adoption moving forward. Yep. Yep. Uh, we've got a couple of questions before I go on to the next theme here, and I'm going to just read these things uh, from, from one of our um, viewers here. It says, a few cities are doing pretty granular whole city simulation of all sector sectors, energy uses and costs residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, and transportation by neighborhood into various future cases. Are any of you teaming with communities to align the utility digital twins and community digital twins? That, you know what, let's, that's a great question. Let's hold that for a second because that, we might want to talk about that later. That, I really like that idea because sometimes utilities think fairly narrow uh, just about their own stuff not the stuff that goes on in the community but we're all part of a, a larger community another question that came up is hi i would like to know more about this six month backlog check when addressing the arcgis data conversion what does that mean exactly not sure exactly uh what we what somebody mentioned about six month was that you tom i don't remember who said I think that they, i think probably respond to my comment oh yeah pat go ahead yeah yeah, just by way of explanation, when we converted our paper maps and records into a geographic information system, uh, as Bill as Bill commented, there was a backlog of work orders and service orders that had not yet but been placed on those maps, and it was file cabinets full of those things. And it's not uncommon for utilities to have 
weeks, months, or, or even longer mm -hmm. of a backlog. So we recognized that before inputting that information into the GIS, we needed to catch up that backlog of information. So we're inputting yeah. the best information into the system. That That's what I what I meant by that. Yeah, no, I think, and I think that answers the question. Um, Peter, you had you kind of wanted to respond to that as well, I think. And Peter, you're on um, either. You're yeah, on, I, mean, you, I mean, I think I, think I talked to yeah, you. Oh, maybe I have a slow connection. Um, can you hear me? Slow. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I do think that there's enormous scope for reducing that as built update backlog, you know, that is typically months. I mean, everybody that I talk to um, in, in the utility space seems to have backlogs measured in multiple months. But really, the sort of things I was talk of, talking about, you know, the aim is really to reduce that from months to minutes, you know, that it should be pretty much instant as you're pushing putting things in the field you just scan them push that back to the gis and then like tom talked to uh push it on uh to adms or outage management other near real-time systems so we're really going to see a dramatic transition from where the gis and other systems are months out of date to where they're being kept in sync yeah. in near real time with what's happening in the field which is going to be a huge change and, and make GIS much more strategic, you know, on the thing of what we've been talking about. Yeah, you kind of you kind of went, um, um, we lost your connection there for just a second. I'm going to just switch over to Angela. Angela, in the gap, because we've, we've, most of us have been more involved in the electric, I think. Angela, what about now, is it still true in the gas industry where there's still a lot of paper backlogs and, and that kind of stuff floating around in, in the uh, in the industry? So I can tell you at our company, we have 14 different um, service areas, divisions, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they range all over the state um, and all 14 had <laughs> different ways of doing things. So yes, some areas did have a lot of paper still in the cabinet. Others were quick to jump on board and get this going. So um, we have a, um, a goal though. We want to have a turnaround time of 42 days total from the time a gas service agreement is signed mm -hmm. till the time that it is done. Um, the meter is set and it's in GIS. Um, before this, it would take weeks, months, you know, even years, like you said, the process of, you know, getting something in and maybe even scanning it into a, a SharePoint site, have somebody else take it. But um, so little by little, if you're able to, you know, get them digitally um, transferred over into a system, then yeah, you're better off doing that. So I'm sure we have places that still have, um, you know, paper, but I think we've done a really good job of, you know, capturing that within our GIS system. Um, and even you talk about legacy items, uh, legacy uh, um, facilities in the ground and stuff. Anytime we go out, anytime anything of ours is exposed, we want somebody there with GPS equipment capturing it. So not only the new stuff, we want to go back and capture the old stuff. And then we can make sure in that yep. system of GIS that it, it's accurate, you know? If, you, if it's exposed, why wouldn't you do that, you know? Well, that's right. When I was digging for my, my manhole cover for my septic system, why didn't I find the, do the location then while the, the hole was dug? Yeah, absolutely okay. true. And that's, you're right. That's another, going back to an earlier question in the audience, certainly that's that's a way of doing it. I mean, Pat, I think you talked about uh, at, at a webinar a long time ago when you, you know, uh, underground, uh, you know, direct buried cables. When you're digging up and repairing, that's the time to capture location. And you didn't always do that. That's true. All right. We, 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 we didn't. Yeah. Um, just, just to follow up on that, Bill, there was yeah, there's a ahead. question. That maybe, maybe Angela could could respond to that. There's a question around uh, ROI for no. investing in in the time and the equipment to to do that. Could you comment on on how your company justified the return on investment for taking the extra time and the extra equipment when things are exposed to capture that information and include it in the in the database? Sure. So. Um, Pico People's Gas is owned by Amera, um, and Amera is very um, generous with um, capital spending, I'd say. So I think we looked at it initially because it was pending legislation. This was going to be something that we didn't really have a choice on. We were going to have to do it. But it, the part of tracking and traceability 
um, did not end up happening and it was put on pause. Um, and we just looked at it because we had a choice then. We didn't have to do it, but we said, you know what, this makes sense. We see it's going in that direction. Um, it makes us safer. Uh, it saves on cost ultimately. So I gave that example of the valve that um, was defective, right? How much money do you waste going out trying to locate where something is? You've got manpower, you've got equipment that you've used to try to locate that. You know, all that type of stuff adds up. It made sense for us to do it. Um, the company is happy to invest in this. Um, and it's only going to expand more. Right now, we're primarily on um, distribution. Uh, we can spread this into transmission even, you know. So um, the return on investment I think is is beyond currency, though. Okay, it's, it's a uh, safety factor. That's 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 a good point. That's a great point. You know, when we talk about KPIs a lot of times or or return on investment, you're right. We 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 tend to think uh, about costs, but there's it's it's really in four areas. I think uh, you know there's a cost, of course, because you got to make money, but it's also a customer service. That's a you know if we can improve customer service. The other is safety for sure, and then of course the fourth one is is just staying out of trouble, regulatory compliance. You, uh, Tom mentioned uh, San Bruno. I mean, the cost, sure, was, was a lot, but the loss of lo life and property was just that much more. So, oh. yeah, so it's, oh. it's, much more, it's much more than just a return on costs. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears and kind of go to our uh, next question a bit. And, um, and then I would want to get back to one of the, our, the audience had another question uh, about uh, these, the, the city and the integration of communities and we should we could perhaps get to that so here's the next question how should we as energy industry practitioners think differently as it pertains to gi systems and related applications and one of the things that that uh, i'll give my comments and then i can ask the audience um, i talk a lot when i give speeches about the term digital transformation and i love that term but not many people i think it's kind of a buzz buzzword and when i think of uh, th thinking digital transformation it's about thinking differently about what we use and, I, and again going back to the old thing well what does people what do people think about when they hear their js oh it's about maps well i actually think it's not just about maps it's about the word one word discovery finding out something that we never knew about finding out where like we're talking about equity, where we ended up with uh, uh, our response, our outage response, our investments really tended to to um, to not take into an account an equity thing, and 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 I always have these examples of of when we converted from uh, you know old digital uh, VHS tapes to DVDs that was like a digital transformation, but it really isn't because we never really changed our behavior. We still had the, the DVD in our glove compartments and our in boxes in our garage. But when we went from DVDs to streaming video, then all of a sudden, oh wait, we're we're completely thinking differently. We're thinking a, a whole new way of, of of looking at the world. And and I'd like to get your thoughts on this notion of thinking differently about GIS and how it will impact uh, the utility industry. And I think I'm going to kick it off with Tom Helmer. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, PJ, can you bring up the electric enterprise slide? So this is kind of my traditional slide when I do roadmaps to try to get GIS adopted right, by all the other lines of business. Uh, the construction work management area is typically, as Bill mentioned and Pat and, and the whole panels, right? That's been the emphasis for years, uh, but I'm gonna concentrate on some of the other high value ones. And then based on time, we may do some more, but let's look at operations and control. And again, the GIS data going to that those systems has been around for a long time, uh, but the, the one of the big values is uh, bringing data back from those systems and using the power of the GIS as a data marshaling tool. So from a digital twin as operating view or uh, because there's really no one system when you look at what's in the op center that gives you a complete view. Uh, and none of those systems are really designed to be great for either management or stakeholder views as well. So bringing it back into the GIS 
and then slicing and dicing the views that may be required. I had some clients that they're getting pushed hard if they have multiple wards they're supporting, right? Tell, tell every ward uh, lieutenant how much resources were applied to their award during the last big event. Uh, right? They want that level of, of visibility. But, but anyway, I, I really think that GIS, just from a technology point of view, is a great data marshaling uh, technology to go ahead and grab a bunch of data from a bunch of operational systems. Mm. And they're listed there uh, that are fairly typical generically and overlaying that and bringing it back and doing you know analytics on it as well i'll talk a little bit about that over on engineering but this is really from an operational and, and control point of view uh using the gis more as that outage communication mechanism uh, most utilities have one two or usually have two or more and modern gis's really can replace the other ones and really have one system that supports the op center supports management view and supports your stakeholder view. Um, can we bring up the gas one now real quick? And again, concentrating in the op center. Uh, I, I really think the GIS technology is great uh, for gas OMS, integrated with things like SCADA, mobile work management, AMI and work management and CIS. So, you know, it's that sweet, but foundationally you can do pretty much everything that has been mandated by the Senate now, right? A bill, the Rondell bill or Rondon bill uh, with just the OMS. So we see that as being a, a huge value of trying to break down uh, barriers and adopting that, you know, technology investment of GIS to other business uh, systems. Uh, following Angela's lead up in the inspection and maintenance area, uh, I, I think that's the other really big area that GIS lends itself to. Uh, I call it bookends. So use the GIS up front to plan the work and use it on the back end to monitor and report if you have your favorite EAM mobile work systems already. But a lot of that functionality that those systems provide, you could move over to enterprise GIS as well. So it's a way of potentially reducing your O&M costs, right? Uh, I have one client, I think they had 8,000 preventive maintenance programs defined in their SAP system for plastic pipe, right? So I'm thinking, why are we having all this stuff for plastic when it really is a periodic type of thing, right? You're not really doing asset management from a condition base or risk base or uh, any of the more advanced asset management paradigms you're really just doing it based on periodic inspections which again the gis can do very well um, so those were the from a operations point of view asset management point of view and then i'm going to ask you to flip back real quick to the power one uh, so over on the system planning, kind of an engineering function, uh, we really see the modern grid needing something like that GIS to be that aggregator in building out that reliability, engineering uh, reliability reporting uh, type of environment. Uh, we had a chance to pilot this with a bunch of data sets for one of our clients, and it really is an intuitive way for reliability engineers to, to do their work, right? Rather than going to a bunch of systems to get historical information as well as forecast of information, bringing all that in and overlaying it on top of uh, their assets makes a lot of sense. And then you know, they can quickly put the system you know, into the condition that has stressed the grid and they can see why maybe it didn't behave as well as they wanted to and then this leads again to the next step of capex right so both from the reliability point of view asset management point of view on the power side and on the gas side the integrity management those are all now inputs right into a good capex process that again we think gis can be leveraged uh, with risk-based analysis so either embed the risk logic 
inside the GIS now with its AI ML type of tools or bring in right your favorite risk type of campaigns mm -hmm. portfolio optimization tool but use that as part of that process so now the execs and the engineers are talking in terms of exposed risk versus dollars when you're doing your capex planning process thank you yeah, great. Hey, Angela, I'm going to turn it over to you because you had some slides too. Maybe I, I was wondering, maybe go back to Tom's gas slide there, and and you could you could uh, work <laughs> off of that idea. But, but uh, maybe yeah, pull up maybe your slides, PJ. We'll pull up uh, Angela's slides. And about think it's really about thinking differently, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So you know you got to think bigger picture, right? You got to think of you know how can you utilize what we have, um, make the most out of it. Um, so I put up a list of different ways that we use our um, GIS system. We refer to it. Um, we ask them. We have them do exercises on different things. So um, first and foremost, of course, is storm preparation and recovery. Um, so that's we get a lot of hurricanes, um, and it's pivotal for us to um, get, get information to be prepared for those storms, but also afterwards, um, when we're down and doing recovery and, and whatever needs to be done, we're really relying on GIS um, and the data that's put into it. Again, meaning you got to have good data going in um, to be reliable when you're um, trying to recover from a storm. So um, we use it for safety and damages on compliance schedules. Um, we verify when work has been completed um, using that. So more like a you know a quality control did this paper as built that they sent in, does that, you know, match up with what we have collected electronically? Um, we use it for tracking easements and agreements. Um, we've used it to help develop uh, meter routes. Um, I think in the beginning you had mentioned, um, Bill, about uh, the next one I have is environmental justice inquiries. So uh, we just yep. had an exercise yep. 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 where, you okay. know, maybe you're not focusing on areas that aren't um, economically as well as others and we had to go into gis and we pulled up records and and in fact we proved that no that's not true we give even more to those areas actually so that that's something that um, we use it for growth opportunities hey where where are we gonna you know we're all over florida but we're not all of florida you know, so we need to track um, the growth opportunities. We use heat maps um, to see, you know, we have a history of seeing where there's been leaks before. Um, so we utilize that. Uh, verifying tariff boundaries, that happens with, um, you know, municipalities. We have exercises, we have to reach out for that. Um, project tracking, customer counts, integrity management. I think between the panel, somebody has mentioned one of these at least once. So this this is how we utilize our GIS system, and it's such an important part of us. Um, I was mentioning how we have 14 different service areas doing things 14 different ways. We never had a uniform um, work management system, so we have just wow. developed one. And in part of that, it was built around our GPS and GIS program. So I mean, it's really GIS for us is like a backbone. Okay, and you've got the different areas going out, like these are the nerves, these are this, this is that, right? So our company really relies on GIS, and I don't see it doing anything but getting better. Um, we went to a contractor safety summit not too long ago, and a person spoke about damage, damage prevention, right, damages. Um, and the number one thing they said to help prevent that is accurate maps, knowing where things are. So that is all playing into getting good data into GIS system. So Perfect. That's that's my slide. <laughs> and you're sticking. That's your that's and you're sticking to it. That's right. That's right. So Peter, <laughs> uh, Peter, and you you've been around this business for a long a long time. And uh, talk about uh, use GIS in ways that or or to think differently about how the, the you know how the utilities work. Yeah, so I've mentioned a couple of things. To double check, can you hear me? I'll take my video off we, if, if you we, can't. We, no, we, we can right now really well. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, so I think there are two areas where we can think differently. You know, one is building on this theme of updates and is 
embracing the idea of crowdsourcing, you know, which is a term you hear a lot, right? Of, uh, but really <clears throat> recognizing that field people can do updates. You know, I think in a lot of cases I see a, a kind of mindset that field people don't have the skills, need technical skills to update the GIS and so on. But I think with the right tools and, uh, you know, the sort of automation I've been talking about, but, but you know, other tools too, I've seen a lot of examples where field users really can embrace this idea and give really good data that can be pushed directly into the GIS, you know, potentially with some QA, but increasingly with less and less as you get that process down. Um, and I think if field users see that by doing that, they see that data come back to them in the field very quickly, you know, they really, you really get buy-in. And so I think that's one important concept I would say people should embrace, which I, I don't see everywhere. Uh, and the second thing, which is maybe related to that, is I think another way to think differently is uh, that this is really a great time to rethink mapping standards. Um, I, I think you alluded to this a little bit at the beginning, Bill, when you said, you know, I've so often heard when people put in a new system, uh, one of their first requirements is to say, we'll get all this great new technology, but we want our maps to look exactly the same as they've always done, because yeah, that's right. what our, our users are used to. But in a lot of cases, you know, and I can understand that from one perspective, but at the same time, most utilities mapping standards were designed to look good on a paper map, you know, black and right. white paper map exactly. 30, right. 30 years ago, and to convey information through that map. So you have all of this really complex annotation. And, you know, now that we're really transitioning to where everybody has a digital device and it's all digital mm -hmm. maps, it makes a lot more sense to dramatically reduce, you know, if, if not, you know, largely eliminate annotation or, or have annotation that is much more dynamic and specific to the task at hand. Um, so I think that's another area that kind of fits with this whole theme of, you know, really pushing updates back automatically and reducing the amount of manual editing that you have to do, because often there's just really a lot of manual editing that goes into sort of mm. details of white space management and so on. So, so I think as people are you know, a lot of people migrating to new systems now, and I just encourage people that while I'm sure you get some user resistance, I, I think rethinking mapping standards is something else that feeds a lot into this automating of data updates. So uh, mm. that's the second thing I'd mention. How about you, Pat? Do you have any thoughts? I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've really appreciated the comments so far. Um, Bill, I liked when you started off talking about maps and, uh, you know, people, often think of maps as the as the first response to what does GIS do and I wonder what do you think of when you think of a map do you think of a, of a small sheet that goes out for staking in the field or do you picture hanging files in a substation um, room flat files well what kind of maps do you picture we're seeing a lot of change in the workforce and if you ask somebody uh, from the younger workforce what is a map they're going to say, well, this is a map. It's a it's a service, right? It's up to date. I can poke at it and get additional information. It knows who I am. It knows what I'm allowed to do. It knows what I'm not allowed to do. And uh, a question came in about how do you get field people to adopt uh, field tools? I would say the answer to that question is you make their life a lot better because they're frustrated by data that's out of date updates that they've given that take six months to show up back in their maps if they even get them that quickly if it takes six months to happen in engineering how long until they have a folded up map in the uh, box behind the seat of their truck it can oftentimes take a lot longer and i think gis is poised with mobile apps that are streamlined to what people need to give engineers and the line workers and customer service reps and managers the information that they need to do their work better and not only within the company but also customers and the community um, to give them the information they need for this for the uh, transparency that they desire you know Angela I love that you you brought up uh, about defending your your company's uh, actions not only do you have to consider your plans and your system performance and decide how you should act but when that comes into question with the GIS, you have the ability to analyze those things that oftentimes prove uh, the good work that you have been doing for a long time. 
Hey, thanks, Pat. So what, we're not going to ask you any more questions. We're going to kind of go to the audience again. We've got about 15 minutes or so left in the session. So let's see if we can um, we can go back over some of these questions. I'm trying to I'm, I'm jumping into some of these questions. Let's see here. Uh, we got. Um, I Bill, I kind of like to hear. I kind of like to hear Peter's take uh, ah, okay. on, on on adoption of uh, resistive field forces. Uh, those that, that want to just oh, keep yeah, doing sure. things the, the same sure. old way. Peter's done a lot of groundbreaking work in this area. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, you know that's a great question and certainly something that we've come across a lot. Uh, obviously, many field crews are quite technology resistant and I guess I'd say a couple of things you know one is obviously we've talked about simplicity in a couple of different contexts and as I mentioned especially with the sort of newest technologies we can make it much more automated where it's really kind of as simple as taking a picture of an asset to capture a lot of detailed and structured information about it so so that can really help and then I think something that I touched on and I, I think you probably did two part is I think it's really crucial that they see the feedback loop that you know they, they put in a change and you know if uh, you have an online system you know if you can get them that back to them the next day or within a couple of days so they see the improvements in the maps you know then they're motivated to do it because you know they do have a, a vested interest in improving the data quality you know it, it helps their work in the field so I'd say those are a couple of really key things um, and then I guess just one other comment, again, someone kind of touched on this, but I think we are seeing this interesting kind of demographic transition where you've got the older field workers, many of whom are nearing retirement, who are quite technology resistant, and then coming in who grew up with PlayStations and all this kind of thing, and they look at this old technology and say, you know, what is this? And, and they're expecting things on iPhones and, and so on. So. So, so I do think that demographic transition helps with the adoption as well. And of course, you know, getting at least some field users engaged will then help bring others in too. So, so those are a few comments I'd make on that. I'd like to add to that too, yeah, if sure. you don't mind. Sure. I have a lot of experience with that. As I mentioned, we have like 180 crews out um, in the field, contractors. And as you can imagine, Florida has a very heavy population of Spanish speaking. So we have a lot of crews where English isn't even their first language. So not only is it a technology thing where you don't want to adopt, it's difficult because it's not your first language, right? So, um, you know, we when we reach out to the contractor companies, we first of all, we'll say to them, you know, send to us your people who, like Peter mentioned, who are open to you know taking on this technology who are a little bit technologically savvy um, and people who are going to be sticking around because um, this is a big investment um, and what we've done is we have had them take um, their paper as those still and then also capture it electronically and then they can compare and say hey this work that you've been doing by hand that takes you know x amount of hours for you to do here it is digitally so if you adopt this you know this process with this equipment and this program, you're going to end up being able to save X amount of time. Um, you know, we also stress to them, this is going to make you safer. You know, your crew member went and collected this information when they installed it. Well, you had to go back out, you know, five years later to go do something with that. Well, because that person collected it accurately, you're now going to be that much safer because you can find it. Um, and then if all else fails, I just tell them it's going to make them more marketable. <laughs> They'll have a, right. a new That's skill right. set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. All right. Well, we're going to do. I'm going to just walk through some of these questions. I don't think we're going to get time to get to all of them, but we did have this earlier question about uh, teaming uh, with the utilities and the community. And and uh, one of the things that that I've always complained about why why can't we build big, bigger bridges? You know, as an electric company, and you're the gas company, Angela. Why can't we communicate better? Why can't the if the water company has a leak and there's you know I don't want to be sending crews out to where there's a flooded area. Why wouldn't we have known about that stuff? I mean, the, the technology has been in place forever to share data, uh, particularly through web services uh, of of your GIS and our system. So we we should be able to do that with the city government, with police, and I mean, you know, the police have all a beautiful GIS that shows where there are um, 
you know, there are high crime areas. Why can't we share that using a web service with the uh, uh, with the utilities so that we would know in advance when we go to a place that there's some there's some issues or some graffiti issues or some damage issues or something like that. So I, I think the technology is in place. We could do it. It's just a matter of having the will uh, and, and the communication uh, at, at people at the, at the policy level to be able to share this data. Sometimes people say, well, we're not going to share our data or it's in a different format. Ah, that yeah. doesn't matter anymore. That stuff is old hat. You don't don't use that as an excuse. Use the cloud. Oh, we we don't want to use it. Well, that's, you know, all of that stuff is excuses to, today. We need, if we were to do that, we would make life much more, um, much better for everybody, including for both both sides. So I think that's, I'm going to just walk through. And then, and then if anybody has comments about any of these things, uh, we did that. Well, let's see. Uh, this is an interesting one as well. And somebody want to comment on this. Good location and network isn't enough anymore. In order for GS to help the utility in the energy transition, it needs engineering and operations data. What are the, what, do, what what anybody thinks about that? I mean, I, Tom, you actually kind of alluded to that as well. Yeah, I, I don't think we want the operation stuff right to be done in the GIS, but using the GIS to correlate it all, I think, is a great use. So it's more of that enterprise GIS application uh, that's integrating with the EAM systems, the operational systems the engineering forecasting systems, but bringing it all in one place. And the right. GIS has some great ad hoc tools as well, right? So that's the other thing. It's not just visualizing stuff from other systems, but now the engineer or the analyst can play what if, and all those other data sets are at their fingertips. They can generate thematic maps by combining, right, a bunch of information. Right, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that, or that's good? We can go to the next question if we want to. Let, let me, uh, and if even you can comment on other ones as well. So there's a question about uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, IoT, and GIS, particularly in the utility industry, the extent of applications. Um, you know, we, we, we at Esri, of course, we have all kinds of APIs into uh, machine learning, AI. You know, you talked about augmented reality as well. I mean, all these things, IoT. Uh, we have we have technology that allows for all kinds of streaming uh, data and and all that kind of stuff. So that that is common. Is it being used in the utility industry? I think, Pat, you may want to comment about that. Do, are we going too far? Or do we need to go more basic and get get some of the? You know, we're we're dealing with paper and then we're talking about machine learning. So I think you know there's a big gap there. What, what, you might I know you 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 have a lot. You've written a lot about that. There is a big gap. Uh, Tom, I'm going to go to you in a second because you've mentioned machine learning uh, a, a couple of times and I think the audience would like to hear what you were referring to. But Great. Bill, I think what, what you're referring to is that uh, I think as technology aficionados, we sometimes get drawn to the bright light mm -hmm. of the latest thing. Yeah. When in fact, most utilities that I talk to are dealing with more fundamental problems like keeping their maps up to date. And uh, I, I advocate the idea of dealing with more fundamental problems first, but there's certainly some great capabilities, many of mm. which are built in to the, the ArcGIS product and more which are connectable to other machine learning and artificial intelligence platforms. Tom, your thoughts? Yes, uh, we're definitely seeing a, a huge uptake on transmission and drones, mm. planes, mm. satellites. And so bringing that in and having raster, raster to vector conversion and even detecting anomalies, right? So not only fly the turf, but detect the anomaly and generate the right repair or inspection action is, you know, right here. The technology is here, whether inside the GIS or there's some definitely some great third party providers that you can see on the GIS new adapter floor that has their own secret sauce for heuristics, right? But either approach is still using basically collect the imagery, apply some AI machine learning and generate actionable stuff. Uh, so I, I think that's coming just because yep. uh, as we know, uh, we have uh, what I call it, three times as much applications from a distributed generation big generation applications for the transmission grid than what the grid supports. So we really need to start building a lot more transmission grids, which again, need a bunch more 
O&M, day, you know, day-to-day health and wealth type of monitoring. So, hmm. yeah, and, and maybe I could just add a, a real quick comment there, which, which is just, you know, from my perspective, you know, I, I completely agree with Pat. You don't do these things, you know, kind of just for the sake of it, or you have to make sure there's a really clear benefit. But in the work that we're doing, you know, we're we're using machine learning to drive computer vision apps. So you just point your phone, it knows this is a pole, this is a manhole, this is a, a transformer. And that's a very pr- practical application of machine learning today. So, you know, it it is here and usable in, in the right scenarios today. Hmm. There's another question that that sort of in in related to the the uh, the, the answers that you felt. Uh, quite, uh, one of our listeners said we are developing and have demoed a remote method for developing and app- applying small commercial building energy models using GIS images and data along with other technology, for example machine learning, without visiting buildings or special metering. Applications include energy efficiency, electrification, performance monitoring, and out outlier identification. And it says, I'm curious whether you've heard of similar applications. And I think you were talking very similar about that. I think that it's not like we're doing these crazy ideas. It's just using AI and GIS and location to make simple uh, simple solutions and automating a lot of the processes. Yeah, Bill, where I see that, and I saw the forecasting question as well, right? I see the DERMS vendors, right? Because you need cloud. Uh, technology for a lot of the forecasting power. So a lot of the DERMS packages really are providing that as a service, right? As you sign up, uh, it's going to look at, quote, quote, what type of load you're putting on the network, yeah. both in summer, winter, you know, type of conditions. And, and then there's the ADMS, I call it light. So there's a, a new technology that I saw this year at um, as a distribute tech and over in Sigre in France, uh, that really is kind of looking at those edge points. So it's bringing in your communities, as you mentioned, and doing a lot more analytics of what's happening in the community and how it's impacting the grid. So it's not inside the op center, this is you know outside. So it's never gonna take over what ADMS does, but in terms of getting green faster, it has a lot of promise and sure. the one company i saw was started you know from my google folks so good solid foundation on software architecture as well okay so we're running out of time we've got about three more minutes what i'd like to do is have each person within the you know 30 seconds give again their final statements of where you think gis is going and if in fact we're going to reach that quantum leap angela why don't you start um, yes, uh, so I do think that. I, I know personally I would like to make sure within like the next 10 years that all of our facilities, um, you know, our legacy facilities are captured in, in GIS. Um, I think it's just going to expand even more with the introduction of our new work asset management program. Mm. You know, we're incorporating that in different ways to track the assets, you know, all the way to like paying invoices. So. And GIS is through that funnel, and it, it goes through that. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any slowdown for us. I see it expanding more and more. Even my department growing, um, and I, I think it's going to do that throughout the industry. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I would say if you remember the pinwheel, ignore construction for a bit because there's a lot of GIS going on there already. But I think all your other work management systems, right? I would leave this as a kind of a parting shot is, you know, adopt the GIS as the front end kind of planning Mm. and the back end reporting to all your work processes. And I and I think you're gonna get, you know, well ready for the the big leap into using enterprise GIS just by augmenting your business processes to bring it in as a you know a better planning solution and a better monitoring solution. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Peter? Yeah, I, I think there's going to be an absolute quantum change in what GIS data will look like over in a five to 10 year period. So more or less zero latency in terms of updates coming back in centimeter accuracy 3d maps of the world there's massive investments coming from strange directions like augmented reality gaming companies like niantic uh, that we can leverage 
um, self-driving cars are driving a huge amount of things. So you're going to have these very, very high precision 3D photorealistic models. That's also going to drive a new generation of visual positioning systems that will kind of supersede high precision GPS for the kind of applications we're doing. Mm -hmm. Just with a standard phone, you can get extremely high accuracy. So, uh, you know, very, very exciting changes that are just going to totally change the the quality and the the look of, of geospatial data in that time frame, I think. Perfectly. Perfect. Pat. Well, Peter, thanks for bringing up 3D. Uh, I think if you're looking into the future, GIS is going to become more 3D in the five to 10 year uh, range. I think you're going to see, see that everywhere. But to just step back and look at the big picture, we as utilities for the last 100 years have done a great job of providing safe, reliable, cost-effective service. And what we've been doing has gotten us there. What we are struggling with as an industry is how to provide all of that and do it in a more sustainable, more resilient, more equitable, more modern way. And I think in order to do that, we need the perspective that GIS brings to all the workflows that you mentioned, Tom. And so I expect to see a lot of growth in this area. We're in the quick steps phase right now, but I think it's gonna pick up a lot of speed as Peter suggested. Great, thanks, Pat. So thank you all panelists, I have great comments, and we could probably talk another couple of hours and answer all of these questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to PJ right now and give some final thoughts. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, panel. Fantastic discussion today, and thank you especially team at S3 for making today's event possible. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. Please take a moment, fill out our survey that pops up as you log off and give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you so much for attending. This does conclude today's presentation.